I suppose the biggest question for most of you is what's it worth? What's it cost and what's it worth? What can you potentially make out of sequestering soil carbon? Um, this might surprise you, but now carbon sales in Australia going into agriculture exceed 194 million a year. Um, so this, it's all ready, it's up and running and there is serious money coming back into agriculture. 140, 194 million a year if for carbon sales exceeds the value of the maize industry, the triticale industry, the soybean industry, etc. So it's still very, very small. 190 million to me is chicken feed. I want to see that at 1.5 billion, 1.9 billion um, you know, within another five to ten years and then billions after that. And once we're in the billions coming back into agriculture, then we're starting to really change agriculture. And I, I believe that's where it's headed. Um, so the way it works for you, or a carbon project works, is that you set up a project on your farm, your property, and you decide what's in and what's out. Um, then there's a methodology that we have to use, uh, which is a government determined set of rules for measuring things and accounting for it. And once that's been measured, you measure, you then get ACCUs or your carbon credits. Uh, and then the ERF, which is the Emission Reduction Fund, uh, that used to have 2.5 billion in it and now is down to about 500 million, 400 million left. Um, you have, uh, we actually have contracts with ERF now for 7.7 um, .7 million tonnes of CO2. So that's about $150 million of credits that we have to sell to you, or not to sell to you. There's 150 million, roughly, of money to come back into people that want to do soil carbon projects within the next few years. Um, so the money's there, it's guaranteed for the next 10 years, and the price is guaranteed. Um, so it's actually out there and it's working. Um, so the thing that drives profitability in doing carbon projects is firstly your sequestration rate. And we're going to talk a bit more about that. David will talk a lot about that and uh, we'll talk a bit more about it. The second is the price of carbon. Right now the price of carbon is historically low. Um, you're averaging just over $10 a tonne back to you at the moment. When the carbon tax was in, uh, companies were paying about $23 a tonne for carbon credits out of agriculture. Um, the cost of measurement uh, at the moment is still fairly high because of what we're forced to do and uh, the scale of projects. So as you go down in size of property, the cost per hectare really escalates uh, because there's a lot of overheads that are the same whether you've got 500 hectares, 5,000 or 50,000 hectares. The overheads on a project are pretty similar. Um, so if we're in uh, just straight buffalo grass country, what, what we've got some evidence of is uh, that you could sequester about half a tonne a year of carbon to 0.7 of a tonne around that sort of thing just from grazing management alone. So from continuous grazing to a cell grazing type system, you would sequester around about half a tonne to 0 0.7, 0 0.75 of a tonne. Um, and that would give you a net income of $7.50 per hectare per annum, averaged over 25 years. So it's, it, you get paid over a 25 year period, um, but that would be your annual income. If you were able to sequester a tonne of carbon per hectare, that would go, your net income would go to $20 a hectare. And two tonnes would give you $45 a hectare income. Now to put that in context, that's the average EBIT for the last three years from uh, the grazing industry in central Queensland. It's $41. So EBIT is net profit per hectare from cattle production. So if you were able to sequester two tonnes of carbon per hectare, you'll be making more money out of carbon credits at $10 a tonne, this is at today's price and today's cost structure of measuring it, um, you make more money on average than you will out of cattle production. And that's with two years 
of current cattle prices in there. So it's an average of the last three years. Um, so, and uh, obviously prior to that, that EBIT was a fair bit lower than $41 before cattle prices went to where they are now. You can see that if you were really able to push sequestration rates, and I'd like you to keep these numbers in mind, let's keep two tonnes in mind, and that sort of level of income compared to cattle production for when David starts to talk. Because um, you'll see that compared to what he's done, that is minor. Um, we've also found that legumes can stimulate carbon production. And this is the first trial uh, that we did. This is on Progardis at three seeding rates. So two kilos per hectare, four kilos per hectare, and eight kilos per hectare. This was planted five years ago. And compared to a continuous, uh, a, a paddock that it wasn't in, and this was under a very primitive grazing system. It had a little bit of rest once a year, something like that, but there was no grazing system associated with this. It was basically just the legume. And you'll see that as the seeding rate went up, the carbon sequestration rate went up. Now there's a, a pretty good reason why that happens, and it's to do with the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Now, a healthy soil wants to maintain a carbon nitrogen ratio of around about 12 to 1. Which means that if we go and add a kilo of nitrogen through either biology or through legumes, you know, but it has to be natural, um, naturally generated nitrogen, we put that into the system, the soil biology has to sequester 12 kilograms of carbon to balance the carbon nitrogen ratio in that soil. So you can see that when you start adding nitrogen to a soil, and David will show you a lot more about what bugs do in terms of nitrogen, um, and we've got this old paradigm that it's only legumes that, sequester, that uh, create nitrogen in the soil, and that's absolute rubbish. Um, so as we add nitrogen, the soil biology must add carbon to balance, to keep the soil balanced. And that's the reason why you see this, that, that with a few years of legumes, so that now is uh, the lowest legume level there, as you can see, is four tonnes of carbon per hectare. Now if I duck back to this graph, um, and unfortunately I haven't put four on here, but five tonnes of carbon per hectare is $121 a hectare a year net income from carbon compared to $45 from livestock production. So in other words, this is serious stuff. It is not fiddling around the edges. If you, if you get this working and really start pouring some carbon into your soils, uh, you're, you're going to get some serious money out the other end. But um, and we'll talk a lot more about how to accelerate it because to us the issue now is this is what we know how to do down here. What we're learning to do now is this bit in here. How do we actually accelerate it? We've only learned to measure it in the last year so uh, one of the reasons why we don't know a lot more is that there has not been accurate <coughs> methods of measuring it uh, up until now. So this year is actually the first year in which we've had accurate measurement methods used in the paddock. Um, in fact, on that Progardis um, trial, we did some sums, and this is uh, what the economics looked like. Um, so a, a high side establishment cost on that, using three kilos of seed, is $156 a hectare. So that's your seed plus your preparation, et cetera, and your planting cost. The establishment cost, assuming that this is about a 10,000 hectare project, uh, is about $15 a hectare for a carbon establishment cost. So a total of $171 a hectare cost. Um, that trial's averaged 38 kilos per head increase in live weight gain over the last five years. Brought back to a per hectare basis, that's about 13 kilos per hectare. At, say, $2.70 a kilo live weight, is $35 a hectare increase in uh, net or its gross margin, if you like, per hectare um, 
from livestock production, but your carbon income from that at $10 a tonne is $98 a hectare a year. That works out at around about 78% return on capital, if that's repeatable. Now, those, those results uh, to me appear to be a little bit too good to be true. So we're actually going back and remeasuring that much more intensively um, the week after next, if it hasn't rained. The downside is your cash flow, though, is lumpy. You've got to put money out up front to establish, to do your carbon establishment cost. Um, in other words, to baseline it. It's five years. Five years later, we remeasure it. And then a year after that, you get your income. But you get income over that first five years. So it's not a very palatable process at the moment because um, you know, you've got a lot of money out before you start getting anything back. Um, so that's uh, probably the biggest problem. We are working on a new methodology at the moment which we're registering in the United States which will allow you to get paid annually. The problem with that is though, you can't uh, convert it into ACCUs. You'll get carbon credits but they won't be, the Australian government won't allow us to trade them as ACCUs even though they'll be exactly the same. Um, so they would have to be traded on the voluntary market. And that market will develop. It's starting to develop a little bit now. Um, I think the, the way to look at this stuff is you've got to look at what are your productivity gains? What do you get out of improving your country and getting more carbon into it first? What are you going to get out of cattle production, etc.? That's where you've got to look. Um, so you get things like improved soil health, increased carrying capacity, water holding capacity, a whole lot of things. Uh, and David will show you some really good figures on, on water holding capacity. Um, and I think the way you've got to look at this is look at your, your productivity is what pays for it and then carbon is your bonus and it's potentially a very large bonus. But it, it's a bonus that will allow you to do things like succession, generate off-farm investments, pay off debt, educate kids, keep your income flat during years of low, low commodity prices or droughts, etc. So there's a lot of uses for these credits in a business uh, to help you drive the business a lot better. Now, and David will show you some really good figures on nitrogen as well when you start fixing your soil up. But this, this bit of data indicates the, the correlation and the tie-up between nitrogen and carbon. So to grow a wheat crop, this is in New South Wales, if you had a half a percent organic carbon in your soil, which is where a lot of their soils are at, they're mostly between there and there, um, you'd have to put on 100 units of nitrogen. So that's 200 kilos of urea, basically a bit more than 200 kilos of urea to grow four ton wheat crop. And you can see that as the carbon level in your soil goes up, the amount, of car the amount of nitrogen you require to grow that crop disappears. By the time you get to about three and a half, four tonnes, or four percent organic carbon in your soil, you'll grow a four tonne wheat crop with no artificial nitrogen. And that's the, and uh, David will actually show you some of the science behind that and why that happens. But it's, um, I put that in just to really demonstrate that 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 carbon nitrogen ratio, you know, it, it works in terms of nitrogen as well for you. So as you build the carbon, you're also building nitrogen in your system. Right. And, that, and nitrogen, as you know, is a pretty big driver of productivity. Um, that should read naught to 30 centimetres there. And I'll put this up, uh, it's just a little bit of data on uh, irrigated cotton. And, and what it shows is that the, the cotton is actually sequestering carbon at depth. If you look up in the surface area, there's really not much happening. But down at 30 to 60 centimetres, and this is over 10 years, this irrigated cotton has actually sequestered a lot of carbon at depth. And, and I think that's a key thing for you to remember when we're talking pastures. So we're, we're measuring down to a metre and a half in soils where we can measure to that depth. Uh, and uh, just keep that in mind and uh, 
that it's really the carbon at depth that we're, we're interested in. And a, a lot of people think that there's a limit to how much carbon you can put in a soil. But there is no limit to how much carbon you can put in a soil. Absolutely no limit at all. Mm -hmm.